Hello everybody, my name is Janice Knox and I am one of the CANA MDs and today we're going to talk about questions that you in cannabis land have submitted. But before we get into the questions, I would like to just review the endocannabinoid system. The reason I'm going to review this system is because many of the questions that you asked are based on what we know about the endocannabinoid system. It's really important to understand the part that this system, or the ECS system as we call it for short, plays in most medical problems. Because if we fully understand what this system does, then we can better direct our medicines, treatments toward uh, repairing that system. So let's talk about just review a little bit about the endocannabinoid system or the ECS. Many of you may know about this system. It's made up primarily of three different parts. We have the receptors, CB1, CB2. We have what we call the endocannabinoids that were named endocannabinoids after cannabis. And these are the neurotransmitters that our body makes. And then there are the enzymes that help to create those endocannabinoids and break those endocannabinoids down. Now this system is an ancient system. It's 600 million years old. So it actually predates cannabis. So cannabis is a, a, a plant that works on the different receptors just as the endocannabinoids do. Now we have different diseases that are attributed to different um, uh, conditions of this endocannabinoid system. We have what we call the endocannabinoid deficiency and we have an endocannabinoid excess. Now this system is affected by many things. Affected by age, illnesses, drugs, stress, the foods we eat. They all play an incredible part in how this system functions. The health of this system is called the endocannabinoid tone. When the tone is off, then we have medical problems. For example, Ethan Russo talks about the endocannabinoid deficiencies. And examples of endocannabinoid deficiencies include things like arthritis, fibromyalgia, and migraine headaches. When you have an overactive system, a system that puts no brakes on uh, neurotransmitters being released, we get things like cancer and diabetes. So the tone or the health of this system is really, really important. But then we have things that work on the system, just like the endocannabinoids do. And that's where cannabis comes into play. Now this system was actually brought to or uncovered in the late 80s, like 1989. It was first discovered. But this system, once again, is a very, very old system and we used cannabis to actually, THC specifically, to find where these receptors actually live. Now one question I get many times from patients is well, how does cannabis work in so many different parts of the body? Well the answer is simple. Those receptors are everywhere. They're concentrated mostly in the central nervous system, at least the CB1 receptor is, and also the CB2 receptor is concentrated mainly and the immune tissues. So you can see how when you're treating a medical problem you have to realize okay what part of the body is being affected and how can we best manipulate this system to treat that disease. So with that being said that's a brief review of the endocannabinoid system and how important it is to medical problems and once again if we understand this system then we understand how to treat the medical problem. So let's start with some of the questions because we have lots of questions and hopefully we'll get to all of them. And even though I'm going to try to answer as many as I can, I can't answer them all thoroughly. We'll just sort of, you know, you know, do a, a, a topical uh, explanation for, for some, uh, some of these questions. So let's start with the questions. And I'm going to read them off and then we will answer those questions for you. Okay? So let's get started. Michael asked, what's the best strain for ALS pain 
and muscle spasm. ALS is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. It's a neurodegenerative disease that leaves their patients crippled. And my answer to you, uh, Michael, is that the, there is no best strain. When we're talking to patients about the best way to take their medicines, usually we're not talking to them about strains or different strain names. What we're trying to retrain people to think of their medicines in terms of the profile. What profile are you using? What profile works best for you? And when we talk about the profile, we're talking about the THC to CBD ratio. What is the profile that works best for you? Now let's break that down a little bit. Neurogenic pain is best treated by THC. Better for you than any of the narcotics. Muscle spasms, best treated by CBD. However, we're always trying to teach patients again that instead of working with individual components or cannabinoids like THC or CBD, it's better to use them in combination. So, for example, GW Pharmaceuticals, which is a, a pharmaceutical company out of England, now have uh, headquarters in Los Angeles, makes a product called Satabex. Satabex is going through the FDA pretty rapidly to be approved to use for multiple sclerosis. Very good in taking care of pain, neurogenic pain, and muscle spasm. Where Satavex has a one-to-one -one ratio. For every one component of THC, there's one of CBD. So that ratio is really important to know. And you want to find the best ratio for you. And this is why. Oftentimes, you can go in and look for a compound or a product that has a name, and it may be inconsistent with the next compound you buy at the very same name? Or what if your grower or your dispensary runs out of the compound and you can't get Bubba Kush or whatever it is? So then it becomes more important to know what you're taking. What ratio worked best for you? For someone who have problems like uh, a degenerative uh, uh, nerve disease, like the ALS and muscle spasms, then I would suggest if you want to get right on top of the treatment, you want to start with probably a ratio 4 to 1 or less. Now, the trick to taking this medicine is to always start slow and very slowly start at a low dosage and, and increase your dosage very slowly. So that's my short answer to uh, your question, your question, uh, Michael. Trista asks about microdosing. Well, that's very interesting, Trista. The answer to that is start low and go slow. What you're trying to achieve here is getting patients to get the minimal effective dose. Once again, the minimal effective dose. What is the dose that relieves all of your symptoms? You start very low in dosage and go slowly to increase. For example, we can easily calculate a dose that you are to take. And we usually are starting off at like 5 milligrams per kilogram. But we're never going to encourage a patient to start at 5 milligrams per kilogram, especially if they're using THC. And it's particularly true for a naive patient. So you want to start lower and, and, and have the patients to titrate, excuse me, titrate yourself up to a point where you're uh, symptoms disappear. We have something called the biphasic effect, and this is when patients go beyond the dose that, that's really necessary to take care of, of their symptoms. And either you're going to get an increase in symptoms, or the symptoms uh, absolutely do not go away, or they may be even worse. And that's because you've gone beyond your most effective dose. Then what we have to do is back them down and start them over at that very low dose once again, taking a few days between and then increasing the dose until the symptoms disappear. So once again, microdosing only means the minimal effective dose. And how do you get to that point? I hope that answers your question, Trista. Lisa, let's see what Lisa's question was. Lisa asked about how much is too much and what time of day is best? Well, Lisa, that's going to depend on 
what your problem is. And once again, let's talk about that endocannabinoid system and the tone or the health of that system. Usually, most of us are probably deficient in what our system can do or the tone is down. So you really have to prime that endocannabinoid system to get it where it, it needs to be as far as its health. The primary job of that endocannabinoid system is to manipulate all the physiological systems in our body, you know, uh, nervous system, hormones, immune system, um, reproductive system. It's constantly adjusting and readjusting to keep our bodies in harmony. So when you're trying to take care of yourself, you want to primarily get that system in tone. And so all of us need most likely some CBD or THC every day just to keep our system in tone. But there is no lethal dose for taking cannabis. Now, you can take cannabis and have side effects. There are side effects. For example, you can have high anxiety, panic disorder, dry mouth, memory, short memory affected, your proprioception, cognition, and your movement, your coordination. If that happens, just find a nice corner to lie down in, have a nice citrus, citrus drink, and go to sleep. But, but there's never too much. And if you dose according to what we talked about with microdosing, starting slow at very low doses, then you will never give yourself too much. We also recommend that you're taking it at least three times a day. Take a dose in the morning, a dose in the afternoon, and a dose at night. And what you take depends on what your goals are for the day. For example, if you need to be awake and alert, then you're going to take a, a, um, a ratio or a profile that's going to let you be awake and alert. If you want to sleep at night, then you're going to use a profile that fits that more accordingly. So it really depends on your goals and what you're trying to treat. If we have a cancer patient, we're always going to start them at super high doses, but once again, we're going to divide it into three doses, and we give it to them in, in ways that they don't feel or we minimize the side effects. So hopefully that answers your, your question, um, Lisa. Next question is Gina, who says she doesn't necessarily have a question, but she had two organs removed and how cannabis helped her out. Well, Gina, you're right on target. Most likely, if your cannabis helped you, it was your endocannabinoid system adjusting and readjusting to bring your body into harmony. Once again, I can't understress how important that endocannabinoid system is. And if you're working with a good um, cannabis therapeutic doctor, they will help guide you through that, what you need to get that system in the tone and what you need to keep yourself on even keel or in a homeostatic place, okay? So let's go to the next question. Jared asks about his type 2 diabetes. Now this is a very interesting question. Can cannabis help manage his diabetes? And Jared, I say absolutely, but I would like to correct you because you're aiming too low if you're thinking about only managing. Diabetes, especially type 2, is one of those medical problems that we look to slow down, if not completely cure. And it's not just cannabis a diabetic type 2 person need, but it's also a lifestyle change. But diabetes is very much affected by the endocannabinoid system. Did you know the endocannabinoid system is not only responsible for handling the multiple physiological systems in our bodies, but it also manages the glucose metabolism at the cellular level in every cell of our body. Diabetes is a disease that can affect different organs, heart disease, atherosclerosis, your kidneys, your, your um, GI system, and also neuropathic pain. Patients have what we call diabetic neuropathy. The best agents for this, thinking about that endocannabinoid system once again, the diabetes is one of those medical problems that's due to an overactive endocannabinoid system. So we want something that's going to kind of slow that system down. And some of the agents that are very good in counteracting CB1, which THC works on, remember the CB1 receptor? THC works on the CB1 receptor. When we want to counteract with CB1, do we want to slow that system down? So CBD is a natural uh, 
uh, component to slowing down CBD, as I'm um, excuse me, the most slowing down THC, but also THCV, THCV, CBDV. These are the barren aspect of of cannabis, tetrahydrocannabinoid barren, cannabidiol barren. All those things are necessary to slow down um, slow down the effects of the endocannabinoid system. Now, some of these are very very hard to find. So one of the things we recommend is that people that you do fresh juicing. And then you're going to get a whole lot of the components that you won't get if you're trying to isolate them. Some of them come in very minute amounts in that plant. So by juicing, you're going to get everything. Remember, the, the, the cannabis plant has not only THC and CBD, but it has all the acidic forms, amino acids. It has the terpenes, also the flavonoids. You know, the, the cannabis plant is an incredible biological, what I call, factory. And so by taking the whole plant, then you're getting everything you need. And we m recommend this for most people. Even if we recommend that you take a profile of 4 to 1 or 10 to 1, we're always going to recommend that if you can get fresh plant to juice the plant and drink, you know, 2 to 4 ounces a day. Um, so can it help with your diabetes? Absolutely. Certainly manage it. But we're looking to turn things like diabetes type 2 totally around. So I hope that answers your question, uh, Jarrett. Jonathan asked about what component of cannabis should he seek for his arthritis? Well, now arthritis is one of those medical problems that is, we term endocannabinoid deficiency. And once again, that deficiency could be due to aging, stress. Stress is huge. Stress equals inflammation equals disease. Um, drugs that we've been on, illnesses that we've had. So once again, we're looking at what is the tone of the endocannabinoid system. And this is where we're going to replace that the, the deficit, which could be your endocannabinoids or the number of receptors. But what we're going to do is give you cannabis to help tone up that system, to get that system back to tone. And this is one of the places that we talk about layering. So not only are you going to take it systemically, in the way that's best for you, which could be vaping, eating, or using a suppository, or using a salve. And when we talk about layering, you're taking it in at least two different ways. We love oils, tinctures, under the tongue, and we love the salves. And one of the reasons why I personally like to talk to patients about taking oils because not only is it going to last a bit longer than vaping, you're going to have a higher blood level by taking the oil. It's going to last for hours longer than vaping or smoking. And also, it, it, you're using less of it. So it can be a cheaper way to take your medicine and use less, less of it. And then we're going to have you to use a topical. If you have arthritis in those, those fingers or in your feet, then use a salve that's higher in THC to fight that pain and CBD to fight the inflammation. So once again, we're talking about layering. When you have something like arthritis, take it systemically. And we always will try to advise to take the cannabis oil first as a tincture or early under the tongue or, you know, or take it as a capsule or a medible or even as a suppository and then to layer it by taking a salve. Arthritis is one of those inflammatory diseases, oftentimes autoimmune, and then we know the significant um, uh, effect that, uh, that the endocannabinoid system has on, on, on diseases like that. The next question is from Karen, and she's asked about treating her fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is a really debilitating disease, and we see lots of patients men and women who complain about their fibromyalgia. It's sort of like arthritis or and autoimmune disease. And once again, fibromyalgia have neurological pain, depression. Uh, these people have problems sleeping. So it, it's a mixture of things that we're trying to treat with, uh, with cannabis. And once again, we would recommend know your profile. THC and CBT together is probably going to be the best treatment for your fibromyalgia. And once again, you're going to take it sublingually. We always like to start patients at at least a minimum of 5 milligrams per kilo. But again, even though we can calculate your dosage, you're going to start low and titrate up to where your symptoms disappear. 
We also, again, recommend that you layer your treatment, so not only taking it systemically, but you're also for places where you can put a salve or rub your oil. We recommend highly that you do that as well to get the best effect from your medicine. So fibromyalgia, once again, is one of those diseases that is an endocannabinoid deficiency, and we want to shore up that endocannabinoid system, and we want to treat the pain. So that's fibromyalgia. Hopefully that is give you some place to start. Next question is Jason. And Jason who asked about how can he use CBD in his one-year-old who is on drugs like Frisium, I'm sorry, and Epilim, which are two of the anti-epileptic drugs that are used in children. When you're talking about children, it's really important. Several things are very, very important. Number one, you really do need to be working with a specialist, a cannabinoid specialist, and a good neurologist because they need to know exactly what you're doing. You also want to be really careful with what you're giving your child because anytime you have a product that may have toxins or pesticides in it, that can be devastating to a child. So you've got to be really, really careful about what you buy and, you, and, and, and have it tested and know exactly what is in your product. Okay, so let's talk about how do you treat your child. If you're going to treat your child, there's three different agents that are very important in, 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 in seizures. Number one, CBD. That's the first one we're always going to try, THC and then THCA. Let's talk about them individually. CBD is one of the cannabinoids. It's the second most famous cannabinoid that has a, a slew of medicinal benefits. CBD is also, you can take it in very high doses, have little or no side effects. In super high doses, you might feel a buzz, but children handle all these things very, very well. But CBD is what we use first in children, and everybody's heard of Charlotte's Web and Charlotte's Story. Well, one of the interesting things that we're seeing, though, is that when we give these kids high CBD, sometimes they'll come immune to it. And so then what do you do? Then we start to add THC. And I tell parents all the time not to be afraid to, hand the, to give your child THC. Once again, you can add THC very uh, slowly and titrate up to where the symptoms disappear. And we're able to see not only are we decreasing the amount of CBD, that the kid is having to use, but also it's cheaper. So when you add THC, you're going to bring the CBD uh, amount down, and it may be cheaper to treat your, 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 your child. The other one that's really important is THCA. Now that is the acidic form the, the, uh, before it's heated and decarboxylated, before it, it loses. Somebody interfere with my call. I'm just going to forget that. Um, I was talking about THC, how it is the raw form, that is very inexpensive to use. And what we're seeing is that it takes a lot less THCA to handle those seizures. Now, when we're treating kids for seizures, we can have a dose that's effective from zero, I mean, excuse me, 0 0.05 milligrams. Some people are able to handle the kid's seizures, their child seizure with as little as that. And we see patients who need as much as 20 to 25 milligrams per kilo. So we have a huge range. And within that range, there's absolutely no toxicity. So that's amazing what you can do with CBD to control seizures and THC and now THCA. And very few people know the benefit of that THC and how effective it is. Once again, it's cheaper to use. Now, with that being said, how do you, what's the best route to get it into your child? Well, that depends on your child, how old your child is. But really, small children, I like rubbing it into their gums. You rub it into their gums. So you may have a couple of drops, just rub it into their gums, or you can stick it under their tongue, or put it in their juice, or put it in their applesauce. Another very effective way to use it is to use it as a suppository. Very effective. And not just in seizure, but for almost any medical problem you have, suppositories not only have the highest blood level, but also you're able to, once again, to use less because it's going to last so long. So using a suppository is another, another very effective way to getting a cannabis into your child or into anyone for that matter who needs to have a higher dose to take care of their medical problems. So that's the extent of my questions today that I, that I received, and hopefully I've answered them and you've gotten something from those answers. Um, 
to review, we talked about the endocannabinoid system and how important that is. And just imagine if we understood that system, how we can titrate or fix our medicines or even develop our medicines to treat that system. I also believe all of us should be on at least between four to 10 milligrams of CBD a day, whether we are sick or not, because we all have stress, we all have endocannabinoid systems, and most of our systems are depressed because of all the, the stressful situations, whether it's, it's relationships or finances or the traffic or politics, we're all dealing with a stressed out conditions. Once again, stress equal inflammation equal medical problems. And so the way that we can get the body ready is to make sure to handle the medical problems or handle that stress is to make sure our endocannabinoid system is in the best possible shape or tone that it can possibly be in. And we can do that by taking at least CBD four to 10 milligrams a day as a supplement. With that being said, I'm going to sign off and wish everybody a very, very happy, merry Christmas and happy holidays for all of you who don't want to talk about Christmas, but have a happy holiday. And the cannabinoid uh, medicine is fabulous and fun. And you'll see a different Canna MD next week. So with that being said, happy holidays, guys.